I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors. On November 5th, 1986, Scott Macklin was murdered in the parking lot of St. Clair Community College in Port Huron, Michigan. Timogen Kinsu was arrested and convicted for the crime, but did he do it? Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, with my courageous co-host, Alice. Courageous! Well, thank you. That reminds me of, like, The Chronicles of Narnia, one of my favorite series as a child. Be courageous, like, oh, as You know, never read it. Really? That actually surprises me about yeah. you. You've read everything under the I sun. I missed out on that one. <laughs> but not C.S. Lewis. <laughs> I bought it. I have a copy of, like, all of it. It's very big and imposing because if you buy it in one book, but I have never actually read it. <laughs> yeah, so I've it's, heard it's really good, it's, obviously. You, you should read it with your child. Okay. Well, that's a great idea. That's, that's a, what I'll is. do. I'll read it with my child. It's actually very I'll mature. And she'll get to experience it's it. It's very mature. Everything. You maybe want to like shield her from some of the life and death and war and some peace of, thing. Yeah. Well, you know, that's <laughs> life. Can't get away from it. <laughs> So welcome everybody back to this episode of The Prosecutors. we got an interesting one today. Before we get into it, I do want to thank the sponsors for today's episode, Pretty Litter, Kitty Litter. We'll be telling you more about them later on, but we do want to welcome them to The Prosecutors family. Welcome, welcome. We are so excited to have them join us and just wait till you hear what they do. You know, I never thought I'd be excited to sell kitty litter, but I'm there. So this is pretty cool. Kitty can't wait litter, to talk though. about that. It really is. It's really fancy. Well, let's not give it away yet. Yeah, okay. Sorry. I'm going to keep, keep people in suspense. So this is an interesting one. This is a different kind of case than we normally do. We've done cases where people have been convicted and are still in jail and need to be there. Scott Peterson. But this is the first one we've done where we have someone who's in prison who might actually be innocent of the crime. We're talking about Timogen Kinsu today. You may know him if you live in Michigan as Fred Freeman. That's his birth name, but he has since changed his name to Timogen Kinsu. We'll, we'll kind of go back and forth on that. So just know whichever name we're using, we're talking about the same guy. And this is a case that we learned about from listening to Maggie Freeling's podcast, Unjust and Unsolved. And if you haven't listened to that, you need to check it out. And, and I just got to say, I'm really excited to talk about this case. I want to go through it. I don't want to, I don't want to give anything away, but I listen to Maggie's show and there are times where I agree with her and there are times where I don't. This case was the most intriguing of all the cases she's covered. This is the one that really got me thinking the most. And I'm really glad that we're able to, to, to check this one out. I don't know, Alice, how you felt when you were listening to Maggie's episode. I also listened to Maggie's episode on this, and I thought it was incredibly well done. But while I was listening to it, I just thought there must be so much that we can discuss, Brett, because this case is one that went through a trial, and um, there has been a lot of movement in this case. And I thought, gosh, I just want to, I want to discuss this case with you, which is why we decided to do this episode. And you know, we'll see where we end up and whether we agree with Maggie. We don't always agree with her. We we love her. We really respect the work she does, but um, we don't always reach the same conclusions as her. So that's why we decided to dive into this case. And I'm interested as we walk through this case, those of you who've already sort of formed an opinion on it, one way or the other, guilty or innocent, as we walk through it, I'm interested to hear whether or not any of your views changed. So please let us know about that. But got to say, this is a great case for those of you who love the procedure and the process of trial. We're going to be talking a lot about the trial that Timogen went through. We're going to talk about a lot the rules of evidence. A lot of interesting things I think you guys will enjoy, but we've talked enough. Let's dive into the case. So here's the story. On November 5th, 1986, so this is an old one, 20-year-old Scott Macklem arrived at the St. Clair Community College 
where he was taking business courses. Scott was engaged to be married to Crystal Merrill, and they were expecting their first child together. But on that day, someone was waiting for Scott. A single shot echoed across campus. Macklin had been killed with a blast from a shotgun. No one saw the murder, but two witnesses did see a man hanging around the parking lot and driving away in a vehicle. Those witnesses would eventually identify Fred Freeman, later known as Timogen Kinsu, as the murderer. Kinsu was Crystal's ex-boyfriend. He was arrested and convicted. But now, decades later, doubts linger about whether or not he was responsible, or if he was in fact 400 miles away at the time of the murder. So Brett, let's go to the timeline. About the end of April or early May of 1986, Crystal Merrill meets Fred Freeman, who we've already told you now goes by Temujin Kensu, at the video store where she works. They decide to go on a date, and that night, according to Crystal, Temujin rapes her. And after that, the two of them begin a relationship. They knew each other for approximately six to eight weeks. Then in June of 1986, Fred is the one who breaks it off with Crystal. He calls just a few more times on the phone and then he goes silent. They don't have any more contact. Crystal doesn't see him or hear from him again until November 13th of that year. Which, note, is after the murder is committed. Right, so about a week and a half or a week or so after the murder. Now, let's back up. So Fred breaks it off with Crystal sometime in June of 1986. So sometime after June, Crystal started dating another man named Arnell, but they didn't date very long because shortly thereafter, Crystal actually reunites with um, Scott, who she had previously dated for a period of time when she was younger. And the two of them decide to get married the next year. So she has moved on quickly from Fred. And she finds out that she is pregnant. When she does, she and Scott decide to move up their wedding to January of 1987. Then on November 5th, 1986, Scott is killed with the blast of one shot from a shotgun. And it's interesting to note, and we're going to talk about this a lot as we walk through this. So Crystal... You know, she lives in Port Huron, Michigan. Timujin, at this point, has actually moved to the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. And those of you who are from Michigan, God bless you. In your crazy state that's not even connected, I don't know what to say. I love you. I love you, but it's <laughs> weird. Those of you who don't live in Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, the UP, as they like to call it up there, is this sort of separate jut of land on the Canadian border that is part of Michigan, but it's not connected to Michigan. It's beautiful. It's, you know, one of the most beautiful places probably in the world, but very separate from Michigan. So he's moved up there. You know, he's kind of moved away. He's about 400 miles away at this point. So, you know, this is 1987. It's not like he's really necessarily keeping up with her that well. If you're going to keep up with her, it's through telephone calls. There's no Facebook. There's no Twitter. There's no, you know, relationship changes going on on her social media. So the last thing he would have known is she started dating this man named Arnell, who is the person she started dating after they broke up. And then at some indeterminate point, she breaks up with Arnell. She starts dating her high school boyfriend, Scott, and then Scott gets murdered. And so we're going to come back to this a lot. But it's just interesting to remember that as far as Timogen's concerned, it's not necessarily Scott who would be the person who might be the source of all his sort of romantic ire. It might be the guy that she started dating immediately after she broke up with him. We're going to tell this story through the lens of the trial. We're going to do this kind of like we did with Scott Peterson. Uh, we were able to get the transcripts of that trial, even though it's a very old trial, we were able to get the transcripts of the trial. And that was uh, due to 
a gentleman named Herb Welzer who who provided those transcripts for for us. Herb's an interesting guy. He used to be an officer in the police department that investigated uh, Fred Freeman's case. At some point, he became a private investigator, and at some point, he decided he didn't know if Fred did it. So he's been working on this case for a while, and he has a lot of resources that he gave us access to. So I want to thank him for doing that. Just another example of when you're in the true crime community, this is the way we need to do it. We need to be sharing information because it's really valuable. And we have all the trial transcripts because of him, and we were able to read those trial transcripts. And we're going to dive into those with you. And one of the things, Alice, that we have said, I don't know, a hundred times now on this podcast. If we've been a lot, if we've been around long enough to say something a hundred times, we said this a hundred <laughs> times. And that's that in a trial, the best story wins. Absolutely, and you see that Brett. in this we case. We see it all the time for both um, the defense and the prosecution. And boy, does the prosecution have a story in this case. Boy, do they ever. They. You know, usually, and I think we've even said this before, it's not, when you say the best story wins, it's not like the soap opera wins or the most dramatic story wins or the most interesting story wins. In this case, it might have been. Because one of the things the prosecution realizes about Fred Freeman very early on is that he is into Eastern religions, Eastern martial arts. His name now is Timujin Kinsu, which is an influence of that and his experience with martial arts and Eastern religions. And he apparently was very good at, at martial arts in particular and was very committed to training in martial arts. Today, that would be something you'd probably praise him for. It would be an interesting thing to talk about at cocktail parties. In the time, though, this is 1987. This is really in the middle of this burgeoning sort of satanic panic, which is an outgrowth of really a fear of the other. And this notion that the other is the enemy. You got to remember, this is 1980s. The Japanese are sort of dominant on the economic world. A lot of you guys, you just don't remember this. It's kind of crazy to have grown up in the 80s and talk to people who, you know, were born in 2000 when in the 1980s we thought like the Japanese were going to own the United States, you know, and now it's obviously China's become the big enemy. But in any event, it was very easy for the prosecution to take this aspect of Timogen's life and and turn it into a negative and they hammer on that and they hammered on it in their opening statement and they hammered on it throughout trial but another thing they did and and maggie does a great job about talking about that and you should listen to maggie's episode if you haven't listened to it already and she does a great job of talking about that aspect the sort of like ninja aspect but there was another thing that i noticed in this case that was really interesting and it was the way the prosecution set up the case as the sort of rural apple pie America versus the city. It's the very first thing they do. They set Crystal up and Scott up as these sort of kids from rural America. And Timogen, Fred Freeman, he's a guy, he's from Flint. He's from urban Michigan. And they paint this picture of two high school sweethearts, Scott Macklem and Crystal Merrill. And they were in love. And they were these rural kids, innocent kids, growing up on a farm. And the prosecutor goes to this whole thing about the farm and doing chores and going to the fields and mopping the floors and all this stuff. And then he says, and then there was Fred Freeman, who grew up in a quote unquote urban environment where he took a, quote, very, very different turn from the kind of life that Crystal and Scott were living. So you can already see this, this development of here we are in our community. You know, we're these like these good American people, these, these nice rural people. And then there's the city, <laughs> the, the urban influences. And the defendant, he represents that. And he came into this place into this area, into this community. And he, you know, he dated, he started dating this nice rural girl and all these terrible things happened. 
And Brett, you know, that's a really interesting distinct or that's a really interesting thing that you note from the prosecution story off the bat. This is what we call being hometown, right? There are uh, pros and cons to being hometown. If this is his hometown, if this is uh, Temujin's hometown, he could use it to his advantage. But what the prosecution is doing from the beginning is saying, jury, you're part of us and we have to protect us from him. He is the outsider. He is the bad guy. And just by the way, give you a little bit of history between about why there are federal courts versus state courts is federal courts span obviously across the country. And the part of the reason there are federal courts is at the founding of our nation, there were concerns that if you are in state and local courts, if you were an outsider, you would always lose. You would never get justice because you would get hometown in this way. And so this is not so much the case anymore. Of course, it, of course, it may happen anecdotally, but that was the concern of our founding fathers, that any outsider from a town would not be able to get a fair trial because of kind of the hometown effect. Yeah, and where you really see that today is in products liability, injury cases, where there are certain places that are just known as these sort of judicial hell holes where you want to bring your case, you want to bring your class action, your injury case, because you know the jury's there are very hostile towards sort of whatever this corporation is, and they're liable to return a really big verdict. So what you often see is an attempt by the, the corporation or whoever's being sued to remove that case to federal court. So based on what Alice is saying, if, for instance, you know, I'm from New Jersey and you're from New York and you sue me in New York, you know, there's diversity jurisdiction. I can say, look, we're diverse. Let's go to federal court, you know, and then there's uh, the amount in, in controversy uh, can also be a determining factor in, in whether or not you're in state court or federal court. And that's exactly right. That's what he's doing here. He is, you know, this is a, this is obviously a murder trial. It's going to be in state court. It's going to be, unless you can get it, the venue moved, which often you can't, it's going to be in the community where the crime happened. And that's what you have here. And Alice's is right. The prosecution is creating this idyllic country life for the victims, while Fred is this bad boy outsider. It's like out of a movie, right, who comes from the big, bad city of Flint. And Flint today and Flint then did not necessarily have the best reputation. And, and they really tried to hammer that Fred is the embodiment of Flint. And during the opening statement, the prosecutor said that Fred wanted Crystal to be his slave. I mean, this is this this opening statement is is kind of crazy. Literally says wanted to be his slave. That he had beaten her, raped her, and quote unquote subjugated her in almost every way. To just make matters worse, they really went into the fact that he was into martial arts and that he possessed these bizarre weapons that maybe the average person from this area didn't know, like nunchucks and swords and knives. You know, it's too bad for Timogen that the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles hadn't come around yet because at the time, this is all very weird and different. And you've already established in the jury's mind that Timogen is a weird, different, dangerous entity from the big bad city that needs to be suppressed. I remember, Brett, at this time, there wasn't something like Amazon where you can get things delivered from all over the world in two days. I mean, if you didn't have a family member who had nunchucks, you probably have never seen them. You've seen them in you know, Jackie Chan movies, but you may not have actually seen them in person. Um, nowadays, you can get just about anything um, for a costume overnight. So these things don't seem so foreign. They don't seem so scary. They don't seem so unattainable for someone who's one of us, right? And so that's what they're doing here is pointing to things that we're, we're probably all thinking, what's the big deal? What's the big deal with nunchucks? What's the big deal with martial arts weapons? We see them all the time, but that's not the case for this jury at this time. And I think it was really interesting listening to Maggie. Those of you who are familiar with the West Memphis Three, there are so many connections, I felt like, between those cases. And it's interesting because, you know, people have negative views of different areas of the country. You know, being from Alabama, I've experienced that in my life before. But, you know, West Memphis Three happens in West Memphis, Arkansas, which is in the grip of the Satanic Panic. 
this is happening in Michigan and it's the exact same play. It's the play of the sort of the other, this is different from our, you know, good Christian, whatever society that we have here in, in rural Arkansas. And I, you know, personally, I, I think this is interesting and I have, I feel like a connection with Timogen kind of like Maggie did just because I'm really interested in different things. And then Timogen, he mentions in Maggie's episode, you know, reading the, the, uh, I Ching and I have a copy of the I Ching sitting on my mantle right now, you know? So I understand this sort of different, he's just different. He's different. Really? I mean, look, people in Flint, weren't necessarily into martial arts and, and reading the, the I Ching at the time either, you know, but he had these unique, these unique interests and it made him different. And Brett, let me say the flip side of this, which shows how being different is not a good thing. So those of you who have seen me on Get Vocals, I'm of Asian descent and I grew up in the South. And I remember as a kid in the 80s and 90s, I actually tried so hard to be the stereotypical American girl. Um, I now look back and think how funny it is, but I would check out books from the library that talked about like that had uh, limericks from like the 1800s, um, songs from like the 1800s, because I wanted so badly to not be different because I looked so different. And so this is the flip side that though he may have looked like any guy from Michigan, because he was interested in something different, he was different and that was not good. And the interesting thing about this, Alice, and the next thing we're going to talk about, should any of that be relevant in a criminal trial? I mean, unless this murder was committed by a ninja star, and I'm not joking about that, or nunchucks, I don't see why. You know, so the prosecution used a large amount of what we call, quote, other acts evidence in this case. What other acts is, it falls under rule of evidence 404B. We've talked about 404B before. 404B is a rule of inclusion. It gives examples of when it is appropriate to introduce evidence or other acts at a trial. But generally speaking, 404 is itself a rule about exclusion. What that rule of evidence is laying out is we do not allow the prosecution to use other bad things a defendant may have done to convict him. So remember, we talked about this in the staircase, Michael Peterson case. The fact that he had a friend who was a woman in another country be found dead at the bottom of a staircase was classic 404 evidence that we did not think should be allowed into evidence because the victim in that case, Kathleen Peterson, was also found dead at the bottom of a staircase. We do this because we want the case to be adjudicated based on the facts before the jury for that specific case. We don't want to just generally say, this person has dealt drugs many times in the past, so therefore he dealt drugs in this instance. Our justice system does not allow that. Instead, our justice system wants to say, did this person sell drugs on this specific occasion to be held accountable for this violation of the law? And I just, you know, I want to say something about this. And I think we said this with Michael Peterson, but in case you hate that case and didn't listen to it, there is something about Rule 404 that will strike you as unusual. Because in life, we don't think this way. We tend to think that if a person does something one time, they'll do it again. You know, classic example, once a cheater, always a cheater, right? So I don't know how many times you've told your friends that when they decide they want to date somebody who cheated on their, you know, previous significant other, maybe with them. And you say to them, well, once a cheater, always a cheater. And they're like, no, no, just because they cheated before doesn't mean they're going to cheat again. And then, of course, they cheat again, and you're proven correct. But in trial, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't send people to jail on the basis that they did a bad thing before that's unrelated to what we're talking about now. Now, the interesting thing about Timogen's case, this is not a case where, for instance, he's on trial for robbing a bank. And he's been convicted of robbing a couple banks in the past. And you say, well, the fact he's robbed a couple banks, that doesn't mean he robbed this bank. And you're like, okay, sure. Right. But in this case, 
this is really classic stuff. With Michael Peterson's case, you could say, well, you have two people dead at the bottom of a staircase, so maybe there's a connection, right? So I teach an evidence class, and when I get to this in my evidence class, I always think back, and not only think back, but play for the students a song by the Judds. I don't know if you guys know the Judds. Alice, do you know who the Judds are? You're way cooler than me. I don't know who. Yes, wait, no, I do. Oh, woo. I don't know that this makes me cool. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I do. I do. I'm sorry. We know who Ashley Judd is. Yes, right? I, I was confused so by Judd's the Judd's. Ashley Judd's like the younger singer or, or the younger sister of Winona Judd and Naomi Judd, who's the mom. And Naomi Judd and Winona Judd were like this country super group back in the 80s, back when this case was going on, as a matter of fact. And they had this song called Love Will Build a Bridge. And it's like, love will build a bridge, right? And they sing this song. That it's all really about good. building this bridge between your heart It wasn't that good. You can keep going. <laughs> so what I always tell my students is when you're thinking about 404 evidence, you need a bridge. You need a bridge between this evidence that seems like it's utterly unrelated to the current case and the current case. And 404B tells you what that bridge is going to be. So maybe it's motive. Maybe it's means. Maybe it's absence of mistake. It's something that makes this unrelated conduct, seemingly unrelated conduct, connected to the crime that you're talking about. And if you can't do that, if you can't build that bridge, it doesn't come in. And in this case, man... They got they got a big canyon they need to cross, and I don't know that they always get there. That was that was an awesome explanation. We've talked about 404B multiple times, but I think that was one of the best explanations of how to get 404B evidence in. So thank you. Do for I that. need to sing some more? No, 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 no. It's no? it's really okay. good. We don't want our Apple rating to go down now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> So, like we were saying, in Kensu's trial, a large amount of this other act's evidence came in. So the judge found that they came in under 404B. They could be included, even though they did not have to do with the specific case, the specific murder at issue. For instance, Crystal testified that while they were dating, Temujin stalked her and raped her. That's an incredibly explosive allegation to make. Now, some of you may be thinking, but it's Crystal's testimony. She can say whatever she wants. While that may be true, um, that sort of evidence is something you're going to have motions in limine about and that um, your counsel probably object to immediately, <laughs> hopefully beforehand. So. And I want to I wanna clear up some confusion on this, what Alice just said, your counsel objects to immediately. If you follow this case, you'll see a lot of criticism of Timogen's counsel in this case. You know, in fact, you'll see people say that he did not object to this. You'll, you'll see people say that he was completely, he was ineffective. And there's a reason for that. And we can talk about that. Well, let's talk about it now. So if, if your counsel is ineffective, there's a case called Gideon versus Wainwright. What's the name of that movie? Gideon's Lamp? Promise? Trumpet. No, Gideon's Promise. Is it Gideon's Trumpet? Yeah, Gideon's Trumpet. It's called Gideon's Trumpet, based on a Gideon's 1964 Trumpet. book by Anthony Lewis. And so you had this guy, Gideon, and I think he actually, it was a pro se case because he said he had a right to a lawyer. He said, the Constitution guarantees me a right to a lawyer. And at the time, it was like, eh. If you can afford it, it does. We can't stop you from having a lawyer, but you don't just get a lawyer because you were charged with something. That's crazy. And he took it all the way to the Supreme Court and he won. And based on that case, Gideon versus Wainwright, you now have a right to an attorney. And for a while it was like, well, you have a right to have an attorney in the room if he's asleep or dead or you know high on cocaine at the time or just stands up and says, you know what? This guy's guilty. Y'all should convict him. If he did that, tough. He had a lawyer. Well, at some point, this case called Strickland came out. And Strickland said, not only do you have a right to a lawyer, you have a right to an effective lawyer. You have a right to a lawyer who is just basically competent. Doesn't have to be a good lawyer, but just competent. Somebody who's going to at least advance your case a little bit. And so a lot of cases that you see when appeals happen, it is based on this. It's based on this this notion that the lawyer was ineffective. And there have been a lot of claims for Timogen, an ineffective counsel, focused on his lawyer. And we're going to talk about why his lawyer had a lot of issues. 
And sometimes it's said that he didn't even object to this. Well, reading through the transcript, he did object. He did object to this. He did say it shouldn't come in, but the judge just wasn't really interested in his objections. And he objected to a lot of things and it just didn't work out. And this is one of those cases where he objected and the lawyer essentially said on the prosecution side, argued that this went to motive and that's why it should come in. And the court agreed with him. Yeah. I mean, so there are certain reasons you can cite to within 404B as to why something should come in and motive is one of them. Lack of mistake, that sort of thing. But remember what the balance is, is the probative value of that information to come in versus the prejudice it may cause. And you can imagine that an allegation of being stalked and raped would ha carry with it a very high risk of prejudice by the listener. And so, you know, the judge made his decision here, but you can see how that is a very weighty decision against Temujin. Now, his defense does try to spin this testimony to Temujin's benefit by saying that Crystal's testimony is hurt because even though she said that Temujin stalked and raped her, she continued to date him after those events. If you're shaking your head while listening to that, I agree. That's not a great argument. Ultimately, this case was appealed all the way up to um, the state Supreme Court. And one of the justices agreed that the judge at the trial level made, the, made a mistake of letting in this information. Justice Shapiro wrote in a concurrence, moreover, the testimony owes was of very limited relevance other than to establish propensity and the danger of unfair prejudice was high. By the time this witness finished testifying on direct examination, defendant had been presented to the jury as a man of very bad character and violent tendencies whose imprisonment imprisonment would be justified even if he was not guilty of the murder with which he was charged. That's a really, really good point. Yeah, a couple things about that. So it's a concurrence. You may be wondering, why is it a concurrence? Why isn't it a dissent? Or if it is a concurrence, why isn't it Temujin free? So, so those of you who don't know what a concurrence is, when you're convicted, obviously you can appeal. And you're appealing up through the process. There are multiple levels of appellate courts. The Supreme Court in your state is the highest level. In this case, Timogen had, he had appealed on various issues, various issues we're going to talk about more later. And the Supreme Court had essentially decided that either they could not consider those issues or the issues he raised were not sufficient. This justice agreed that on the footing they were in, they could not actually consider some of the things that this justice thought were really important. He thought, he thought this issue made Timogen's conviction unfair. Unfortunately, in a prior case, the courts had already decided that, that Timogen could not succeed on this issue. So essentially, the hands of this justice were bound. He wanted to give him relief because he thought this was unfair, but he couldn't. So what he did is he concurred in the judgment because he realized that based on the law, the judgment was correct, but because he disagreed with an important part of this, he decided to write a concurrence. Now, why would you do that? He is sending a message that this is an unfair conviction in his mind. He knows he can't do anything about it, but there are other avenues of relief. One of them, for instance, might be clemency. The governor could, could release Timogen if the governor decided this was an unfair conviction. You might have uh, a conviction integrity unit which we'll talk about later, who could decide this was not, this was not a good conviction. And so what he's trying to do is he's saying, look, under the rule of law in my place, I can't do anything here, but here are all the reasons that someone should think about looking at this conviction again. Absolutely. For example, if you look at Supreme Court opinions, some of the most fiery and flavorful opinions are the dissents and the concurrences, because those judges those justices don't have to get the um, buy-in of any other justice. They can just write what they want, their opinions, and it doesn't affect the holding and what all other case law is bound by. And so they can really express 
what they think the law should be or where they think the case should be and how the case should be decided despite being bound by the law or prior holdings in a case. And a good example of that that you guys have probably all heard of, you may have heard of Plessy versus Ferguson, which is a case from the 1890s that upheld segregation. And then you've probably heard of Brown versus Board of Education, which is a case from the 1950s that said segregation is unconstitutional. In Plessy versus Ferguson, the United States Supreme Court, there was one dissent. There was one justice who thought they got it wrong, Justice Harlan, and he wrote this great dissent. Nobody cares what Plessy versus Ferguson said anymore, but his dissent was really good. And, he, and it took, you know, 60 years, but eventually that dissent was vindicated in Brown versus Board of Education. And so oftentimes you'll have these, these dissents, these fiery dissents that are written to send that message that something needs to be done. Right. Absolutely. One other thing, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to harp on this, but I just think this is a really interesting comment. The very last sentence here is why we don't allow this information in. So the judge, he doesn't just say, the justice, he, ju he doesn't just say that this is irrelevant. He doesn't just say it's unduly prejudicial. He tells you what the problem is. You talk about jury nullification sometimes. I don't know if we've talked about that on this podcast, but jury nullification is essentially when you try and convince a jury to ignore the law and ignore the facts and convict or quit someone for reasons unrelated to the case. You know, maybe you have somebody who's, who's up on marijuana possession and you say, look, marijuana laws are unjust. You shouldn't hold it against this guy. He's got a family, like all these reasons that are unrelated to whether or not he possessed marijuana. And the jury goes back and they're like, you know what? Screw this. We're not convicting this guy. Let's acquit him. And they do. And it's over. They acquitted him. They're done. Here you have sort of the reversal of that. You have the prosecution essentially telling the jury, look, you may have doubt about whether or not this guy killed Scott. You don't need to worry about that. This is a dangerous man and he needs to be in jail. We need to protect people. This is our opportunity to do that. So convict him. And that's what this justice is identifying as the problem with letting all this information in. And that's exactly what 404B is trying to protect against, right? That's why it goes against what we intuitively think should be used in court about a person's character. The media, or you'll see the media often attack people based on other acts all the time. You know, like you said, once a liar, always a liar. This man is just dangerous. We haven't been able to get him for those other robberies. So even if he didn't rob this you know, this bank at this time, we know he's robbed lots of other banks before. So go ahead and put him in jail and you can have a clear conscience. And that's precisely what 404, rule 404 is trying to protect against. And that's what Justice Shapiro has his thumb on right there. He has said this type of testimony is so harmful because I'll read it to you again. It would be justified even if he was not guilty of the murder with which he was charged to put him in prison. Now, that wasn't it, because an entire day of trial was taken with witnesses testifying that Temujin had claimed to be a ninja. Now, Justice Shapiro wryly noted that a shotgun is not a traditional ninja weapon and described the evidence as not only unduly prejudicial, but wholly irrelevant. Justice Shapiro concluded, finally, it cannot be said that the improper admission of this other act's testimony was harmless. There was extensive alibi testimony that the jury may well have given more weight had defendant not been presented as a rapist with delusions about belonging to a secret ninja organization. And Alex, you had said earlier that this stuff would be relevant if Scott had been killed with a ninja star or if he'd been, you know, nunchucked to death, you know, or sliced up with a katana, any of that stuff would have made this relevant because obviously there's a connection then, you know, I mean, say they don't find the murder weapon, but they determined that he's, he was murdered with nunchucks. Well, the fact that the guy has martial arts training suddenly becomes relevant. Because now you have a direct connection between the means with which he was murdered and something about the defendant. But dude was killed with a shotgun. You know, you can buy those at Walmart. Or you used to be able to. I don't know if you can anymore. I bought mine from Walmart. And anybody can get them. So what difference does it make if he's good at kicking boards and breaking them? 
You know, what difference does it make if he, if he owns nunchucks? Why is that relevant? How is that relevant? How is the fact that he is trained in martial arts relevant to whether or not he took a shotgun and shot someone? What's the connection? Other than prejudice, other than saying he's a violent person, only a violent person would be involved in this kind of stuff. And since he's violent, any violence he could have perpetrated, including shooting someone with a shotgun. I mean, the justice, he just, he just, he nails it. I mean, he knocks it out of the park. He, he, he's unable to do anything about this, but all of this is completely irrelevant. And I will tell you, Maggie connects this to the, the West Memphis three. Eventually we're going to do the West Memphis three, but the more, the less evidence you have in a case, the more you see this stuff, the less actual evidence you have connecting someone to a murder or a crime the more you see this. Because what the prosecutor is doing is he's asking the jury to ignore the fact he doesn't actually have any evidence. He's asking them to do that. He's not doing it explicitly. If you asked him, he would deny that until the end of time. But that's exactly what he's doing. Right, absolutely. I mean, this just rings so much of unfair, unfairly prejudicial information that we never see a bridge within the trial made from the prosecution to how this relates to his crime. Like you were saying, they'd fail your class. Yeah, they absolutely would fail the class. Just like Alice would have. Uh, <laughs> hey, that was a low blow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I took Brett's uh, exam as a, you know, as a read through for potential to help me edits. Out. To help me and out. I failed. I totally failed it. <laughs> it was hard. <laughs> On the curve, you definitely would have passed. So it's fine. <laughs> Anyway, I'll probably cut that out. I probably won't. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, there's two things, there's two types of 404 evidence here, and, and I think it's worth it to separate those out because, and we're going to talk about this more, but you have Crystal's testimony, which is all about the fact that Kinsu is a rapist and, 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 and all these bad things, and then you have the fact that he's a ninja. No way the ninja stuff should have come in. No way. No way. That's absurd. It's absurd. The job of the judge is to keep that out. None of that should have come in. It wouldn't come in today. I feel like I feel confident in that, that none of that kind of stuff would come in. It simply is not related to this murder. There's nothing about it that's related to this murder for all the reasons we've said. That shouldn't have come in. That's a clear mistake. Brett, this is not unlike what the defense tried to say about a potential uh, satanic cult in the Scott Peterson case getting Lacey Peterson, right? There was no evidence for it, but it was trying to build on people's fears of a satanic cult in general. So I only say that because people may be able to relate better right now to satanic cults than say a secret ninja assassin association. They're just trying to drum up some sort of affiliation that will, that is the other, that is unknown to the jury pool, that they just don't know anything. They don't know ninjas. They don't know what a ninja organization does, except that it sounds scary and dangerous and that they can assassinate people. And that's what happened here. And we need to, we need to, if this guy's a member of a ninja cult, he needs to be in jail, whether you kill this guy or not. And that's what they're saying. The stuff about Crystal and her being raped is different. I don't necessarily think it should have come in. It's obviously very prejudicial, but it's at least a close call because the theory the prosecution's operating with here is that Kinsu murdered Scott because he was jealous and controlling of Crystal. And an example of that is the fact that, you know, he raped her and he, she was his slave and she had to do whatever he wanted. That's, that's sort of their theory of his motive. So you at least have a hook there. You can at least see the connection. And the question is, is the connection, is it a bridge too far? We talked about bridges. Is that just too far? There's, it's just too, it's just not close enough. It's too tenuous. And it is so prejudicial. It is so prejudicial. We talked about rule 404. Rule 403 says that evidence comes in unless it is unfairly, substantially more unfairly prejudicial than it is probative. So essentially... It's so prejudicial in an unfair way, and it's only a little bit, you know, tells you something about the case. So in this case, what you essentially have the judge saying is, look, motive's really important. And the fact that he was controlling of Crystal, that's his motive. And he wouldn't like the fact that she was going to marry somebody else and that she was pregnant with some other guy's kid. So that's really probative of why he would have done this. So even though it's super prejudicial too, 
in the in the sort of the scale there, we're going to balance. At the end of the day, we're going to let this come in. And defense attorney, you're just going to have to deal with it. And the way the defense attorney tries to deal with it is to say, would anybody continue to date this man if he raped her on the first date? Frankly, in 1987, that was probably a pretty good argument. I think today people would look askance at that because we have a much better understanding of, of sort of controlling relationships and how, in fact, that might very well happen. But that was his argument. That's what he was trying to say. Timogen was convicted, so obviously it was not very effective. Now, why was this important? It was important, as Justice Shapiro points out, because Timogen had this incredible alibi defense. And the prosecution needed a way to overcome that. Now, if you guys listen to the Truth and Justice podcast, you know Bob Ruff has said before that a alibi defense never works. That an alibi defense at best convinces the police not to investigate you, but if it ever goes to trial, it doesn't work. And if there is ever an example of that, it is this case. So Timshin had double-digit witnesses who testified, who testified in trial or told police that he was in the Upper Peninsula at the time of the murder. In fact, he was about 400 miles away from where the murder was committed. Now, one of these witnesses was his girlfriend, who you might say, hey, she's got a reason to lie, though interestingly, she didn't testify for reasons we'll discuss later. But there were also a number of people who had no reason to lie about his whereabouts. In fact, all told, Kinsu called 21 witnesses in his defense, which in my experience is about 21 more than the defense usually is able to muster. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I know we were joking about this before we started recording, but I truly don't think I could muster up 21 people to testify as to where I was today. And so for him to be able to get 21 people to come say under oath that he was in the Upper Peninsula at this time is quite phenomenal. And we'll talk more about who these people are. These are not just his, you know, best friends or who have his best interest in mind. A lot of these people couldn't care less about Temujin. Yeah. These people are completely random. They were completely random. And that's the best kind of alibi because these people don't have one thread connecting all of them that you can see why they would be telling the same story. It makes no sense why they would even show up except that they were subpoenaed and they testified to the truth or what they believe to be the truth, which is that Temujin was 400 miles away. Yeah, and you read you read the transcript, and it's just these people are, uh, you know, they're up on the stand. It's like, do you remember seeing him? Yes. What day was it? Tuesday, November 5th. How do you know that? Well, and it's always some random thing like, well, you know, my, my kid had his, his in-service day that day or, you know, teacher meeting. So I had to go to that. So I know it was on that day because I can remember after I went to karate class, I had to go to school for my kid or like, I mean, it's that kind of thing, you know, people who just, or one guy who remembered that they were in their dojo because one of the places he was seen was in the martial arts place and they were doing a particularly difficult thing that day. And so he knew that that was the day he saw him. And another guy who was also in the dojo knew he only went there two days a week, Tuesday and Wednesday. And he knew it wasn't Wednesday because he didn't go on Wednesday. So the only day he could have seen him was Tuesday, and he remembered him speaking to the owner because he had to wait for him to finish the conversation before he could go speak to the owner himself. And they just put witness after witness after witness after witness on the stands who said, look, he's 400 miles away. There's no way. And this was, so the murder happens in the morning about 9 o'clock. And this is all like 10.30 or so, 11. So not perfectly on top of the murder, but... Close enough. I mean, you don't have to do the math here. 400 miles of a drive, even if you've got an interstate going, you know, straight there in Montana where there's no speed limit, you're not getting there in less than four hours, right? So there's no way that he could have driven down there, murdered this person, and driven back in time to be at the dojo at 10 o'clock. It's just not possible. And so the prosecution had to get creative and in what is one of the most insane things I have I've ever seen in any trial anywhere <laughs> I mean I just can't even imagine doing this the prosecution in rebuttal so 
It is so bad. The defense crushes their case so badly that they have to they have to bring in rebuttal witnesses. And one of them they call a state government pilot. In fact, the pilot who typically flew the prosecutor to the stand to testify that if Kinsu rented a plane and flew from the Upper Peninsula down to where Scott was, he would have had time to murder him, get back on the plane, fly back to the Upper Peninsula, go to his class, and ta-da, the alibi means nothing. Now, what's the problem with that theory, Brett? <laughs> well, there's so many problems with it, you know, but one of the problems, the biggest one for me, is the prosecution's whole case is based on the identification of someone who saw the murderer driving their car away from the murder. And they identify Timogen, and we'll talk about why that identification is suspect later, but they identify him. So it's actually not as simple as the prosecution made out to be. He has to fly down there. He then has to somehow acquire a car, drive that car down, commit the murder, get rid of the car such that the car is never discovered, get back to the plane, and then fly back to Michigan. No explanation by the prosecution of that. How much does it cost to charter a private plane? Just a lot. Ballpark. <laughs> and so the prosecution in there, a lot. And, you know, I forget, they talk about how much it cost at the time. And this is 1987, so it's a lot more. And Timogen was not a wealthy man. He did not have a lot of money. There's really no indication that he would be able to afford this. And so the prosecution, they ask him a bunch of questions about how, well, you have to fly so many hours a month, right? So, well, so if you needed to fly anyway and you need to get those hours, would you let somebody fly and maybe just pay for the gasoline? And the, and the pilot's like, sure, I would do that. And it's like, okay. So the whole theory is that he found some pilot who needed some hours to fly or just wanted to fly for the fun of it. He agreed to pay for the gasoline. The guy flew him down and flew him back. Never located the pilot. No indication that he did this. I mean, no evidence whatsoever. None. Zip. Zero. Nada. The reason this is such an infuriating um, rebuttal witness is because this is what we put our finger on for the Nature article in the Dyatlov Pass uh, series. We said the Nature article saying that it was possible for an avalanche to have occurred on the incline based on the degrees and based on a bunch of math that some sort of a avalanche or snow slide was possible, not that probable, just possible mathematically to have happened, doesn't mean it happened in the Dyatlov Pass case because there was absolutely no evidence of such a thing happening. Here too, all the rebuttal witness for the prosecution is doing is saying it is mathematically possible or saying it's not in the realm of impossibility if everything fits perfectly for this for him to have been able to fly the problem is there's absolutely no log no flight log of it no flight record no evidence no money moving back and forth that could show this and like brett said temujen is not wealthy he is not rolling in the dough he is truly living paycheck by to paycheck and he doesn't have a lot of money to spend not even on gas for a private chartered plane and so for them to push this so hard when there's absolutely no evidence is is really infuriating and and it is so infuriating and you make a good point that's a great comparison at least the nature article is just academic you know at least we're just talking about what might have happened in this 60 70 year old mystery we're all trying to solve you got a man's life at stake here and you're going to you're essentially you're just giving the you're giving the jury an excuse you know the jury has been faced with really almost ironclad evidence that he could not have done it that it's impossible and they're going to go back there and they're going to say man this guy's violent and he's awful and he rapes people and he's a ninja and he's part of this organization and we just really need to put him in jail but we can't put him in jail because Dang it, there's no way he could have done it. And you're like, well, he could have flown. And so then they go back and say, well, he could have flown. No, nah, we'll worry about that. Well, since he could have flown, let's go ahead and put him in jail because that'll probably make the community safe. And we're a nice farming community, rural community. We don't need these urban people in here anyway. And he's a ninja. He's an urban ninja. even worse. So in other words, Brett, 
Sorry, I'm cutting you off a little. So in other words, no, no, this is exactly ahead. what Justice Shapiro said would happen. He said the evidence that yep. was presented to the jury as a man of very bad character and violent tendencies whose imprisonment would be justified, even if he was not guilty of the murder with which he was charged. That's the only purpose of this rebuttal witness. That's exactly right. It and gives the jury an out. It gives the jury an out. And we're going to spend another episode on this case, but just in case, in case you're not irritated enough by this, we will leave you with this one last piece of actual evidence in this case. There's been so little. We have an actual piece of evidence. You may recall that Scott was killed with a shotgun. Well, you might think that would make the box of shotgun shells that were found in the parking lot where he was killed particularly relevant to whether whether or not or how he was killed and whether or not the person that was being charged by the prosecution actually did it and they found that box of shells and wouldn't you know it they were fingerprints on that box of shells and they compared them to the fingerprints of Timothy Kinsu and none of them matched so that's a great note to end on a great note to end on and i've got to imagine you guys have thoughts already as we continue this case you guys know how to get in touch with us but i'll give you the the information again prosecutorspod at gmail.com at prosecutorspod for all of the various social medias if you want to get these episodes early and generally without ads you can check us out on patreon where we hang out a good bit and we also have some get vocals where we talk to our patreons you guys have heard those those uh, we release them afterwards so you've heard some of those discussions so if you got questions you want to engage with us please do join that uh, check us out on our website prosecutorspodcast.com continue to support our friends hannah hill who does all the art for this case she's amazing at serious moonlight on instagram uh, if you go to our store if you buy anything from our store that will all support the cold case research institute and all the good work they do so don't be strangers don't be shy we love hearing from you guys head over to the gallery on facebook have a conversation with all of our fans and friends who are there and of course as we've already said in this episode if you support prosecutors podcast you need to support pretty litter if you have a cat cat will love it they supported us they sponsored this episode go check them out well, Alice, we're going to do this again next week and talk some more about Timogen Kinsu. But for now, do you have anything else you want to add? That's it. Thank you guys for joining us on this wild ride. And if you haven't already listened to it, go on over to Maggie Freeling's Unjust and Unsolved podcast and listen to the episode on Temujin Kensu. And then come back and listen to ours. And I think you'll get a pretty good, um, thorough story um, about what Kensu has gone through. And this may be a little early to say this since we do have an entire episode left, but if you are already feeling indignant and feel as though an injustice was done here, remember the governor of Michigan can solve this problem immediately. So if you want to reach out to Gretchen Whitmer, who is the current governor of Michigan, and encourage her to take a look at this case and reconsider it, I would advise you to go ahead and do so. We'll be back next week with more information on this case and more discussion. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutor. we say is permanent just you know i'm gonna replace courageous with you know big loser later <laughs> so. reminds me of c.s lewis <laughs> <laughs> you did it not me <laughs>
and it's like love will build a bridge between your heart and mine.